Missy Franklin is an American former competitive swimmer and a five-time Olympic gold medalist. She has been named World Swimmer of the Year and American Swimmer of the Year and has 27 medals in international competitions. She previously held the world record in the 200 meter backstroke and for the mo most World Aquatics Championships medals in women's swimming. Missy, thank you so much for joining us here today. It is a pleasure to be hosting you. Oh, likewise. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you a bit about your early life. You initially started swimming lessons, I believe, in order to overcome your fear of water. Um, and how could you tell us a bit about how you went from that to picking up swimming professionally? Of course. So it actually was not my fear. It was my mom's. So my mom never learned how to swim properly. And so she was really terrified of the water. And that really stays with you. You know, when you're not exposed to that at an early age, it is definitely a little bit intimidating to try and get back into it a little later on. And so she did not want to pass that fear on to me. And so essentially when I was born, she signed me up for mommy and me lessons at the YMCA and we got in the water together. So I initially started swimming just to be safe as possible in the water. That is what my mom wanted for me. And then I just loved it so much. I mean, I just had the biggest smile on my face every time I started summer club swimming, which is just a really fun recreational program that just happens in the summers. And after that was when I was five. And after two years of that, I was like, I, I want more of this. Just doing it in the summer isn't enough. So I started swimming year round when I was seven. Um, at what point did you and your family realize that actually you weren't just swimming for a hobby, that this was something you would and should be taking on professionally? I would say, I think I really got serious about it when I was 13 and that's super young. Uh, so I always want to preface it with, we are all on our own timelines and there's no right way to do stuff. Some people don't really find their calling until much later on. Mine happened very early in my life. So I don't want any young swimmers listening to be like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm 16. And I still like everyone is, is on their own journey. But I qualified for Olympic trials uh, when I was 12 years old. And so I went to Olympic trials for the Beijing 2008 Olympics for USA in uh, when I was 13. So I was very young. It was a very formative experience. You know, I was at a meet with people that I had grown up watching on TV. I was literally swimming in the warm down pool next to Michael Phelps and Natalie Coughlin and Nathan Adrian. And it was just the most incredible experience. And I actually got to see in person what it was like for someone to make an Olympic team. And it truly was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. And I left that meet and I remember looking at my parents and saying, you know, I knew I wasn't gonna make the team this year, that wasn't the goal, but four years from now, I wanna have a shot at making the Olympic team. I don't care what it takes, but I want a shot. And from that point on, the next four years, my family and myself, we just fully dedicated ourselves to that and just kept improving and started qualifying for junior national teams and then national teams and world championship teams and started traveling internationally before, before you know it, four years had passed and I qualified for my first Olympic team when I was 17. Um, I will go on to talking about kind of qualifying for the Olympics and so on and so forth. But before that, I quickly wanted to ask, your parents, I believe, are dual nationality holders, they meaning are. you could have competed for both Canada and the US, but you chose to qualify, compete for the US. Um, could you tell us a bit more about why you chose to stick with the US, even though Canada would have been possibly slightly easier? Yeah, absolutely. So I am so proud to have dual citizenship with Canada. Uh, both my parents were born, raised, lived almost half of their lives there. So we have very, very strong ties to Canada. Uh, my aunt still uh, still lives there and I have a cousin that still lives there and we try and get up as frequently as possible. But I was actually born in California. So I'm so grateful I could have dual citizenship because of my parents, but I never lived in Canada. And just because of that reason, and that truly is the only reason, I would have been very proud to represent Canada as well. But in my heart, I've always been American, first and foremost, because I was born here, I was raised here. And again, I'm so proud of my ties to Canada, but to me, it was always, always going to be swimming with, with an American flag on my cap. Um, going now to um, the Olympics, you 
um, qualified for the Olympics, I believe, when you were 17 years old, um, as you said. Um, and I will kind of go on to talking about the technicalities of that and so on. But before that, I wanted to ask, what are some of the personal sacrifices you made? Um, you said you and your family dedicated kind of the four years in between entirely to you um, kind of getting better and finally qualifying. So could you tell us a bit more about the sacrifices and how you manage things like your education and your social life and growing up yeah. alongside? <laughs> what social life? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know, it it's sacrifices, but you know, they're always worth it. So it never feels like you're actually sacrificing anything when you truly believe that your actions are helping you pursue your dreams. And that's really how I always felt was, yes, my life probably looked a little bit different than some other kids that were my age, but I never resented that because I loved what I was doing and I wouldn't have it any other way. And I think something my parents and I did really well was making sure we always maintained that balance. So for me, my education always came first. That was priority no matter what, because my parents made it very clear to me from a very early age that yes, sports are wonderful and you can absolutely have a professional career with them, but at some point, you know, swimming will end. You know, there is a day and a time where it will end. Your education is something that is going to carry you on for the rest of your life. And so school was always the number one priority for me. And that actually helped a lot because, you know, kind of having the balance of, of homework and classmates, like really kind of took my mind off of the pool when it needed to be off of the pool. So I really appreciated that. And then, like I said, with balance, I think that was just kind of how I managed my social life too, is you know, if I had morning practice on a Saturday and one of my best girlfriends was having a sleepover on a Friday, I would go over for dinner and spend a couple hours, but then I would come home and not stay the sleepover so I could be up early and go to morning practice. So it wasn't that I was cutting everything, every normal 13, 14, 15, 16 year old should do out of my life. It was just, how can I do this in moderation so that I'm training at the level I want to be training at while also still having all of these experiences. Um, so when you were kind of doing all of this prep for 2012, you ended up breaking the first world record of your career in 200 meter backstroke at the 2011 Phoenix Swimming World Cup. Could you describe this feeling to us? Um, and did it ultimately just push you to work harder? It really did. And you know, it's, it's such a funny story because I think when people think about world records, you never really think about breaking them by accident. But that is entirely what happened with my first world record. It was the, the second stop of a meet uh, series that we were on. And these series go so quickly and you're swimming so many events and you're just exhausted. I mean, by the time we were at this meet, I was already so tired. I think this was like my third swim of the day. And I remember thinking, like, just finish. Like, that was honestly my goal before I started that race was like, just swim the eight laps. And if you like touch the wall, I'll be proud of myself like that's all that matters and I touched the wall and looked up and I heard them playing the song that they played when someone broke a world record and I was like the stereo's broken like that's so weird why is that song playing and then I looked at the scoreboard and saw the world record um, symbol next to my time and my name and it took several minutes for it to sink in because I was honestly so in shock. I didn't even know the world record time before going into that race. It was not even remotely on my radar, but it was such a special moment because of that. And, and two things I remember most about it were Michael Phelps was actually at that swim meet and I've known MP since I was 13. So he's been like a big brother to me throughout my entire career. And I just remember you know, for a young swimmer to grow up watching the greatest Olympian of all time and to break your first world record in front of him and to get a hug from him after. Like that was just, I think that was really something that I held so dear. And he just looked at me and smiled and was like, the first one's always the best. Like just take it in and appreciate it. And then later that night, uh, I had a couple teammates there with me and they went around the hotel and they collected all of the fake flowers out of the vases from around the lobby of the <laughs> hotel and left them outside of my door with like a congratulations note. So it was the sweetest thing, but it was, it was very unexpected, but definitely, definitely a huge motivator as I moved forward. 
Um, coming now, finally, to 2012, could you tell us a bit about your experiences of the trials? Obviously, this time you really were aiming to qualify for the team. Um, and what your biggest fears were once you'd qualified leading up to London? Absolutely. So I think, just like you said, it was a totally different experience for me this time. 2008 helped so much because I knew what to expect, right? I knew the facilities, I knew how the meet was run, I knew what it looked like. And, and so that helped take a lot of that unknown fear kind of away. Like I, I really understood, you know, what my goal was there, what I needed to do. And everyone will always say that Olympic trials is infinitely harder than the actual Olympics themselves because the pressure of the eight days of Olympic trials were literally four years of work comes down to, in our case, anywhere from 30 seconds to, to two minutes. And we get that one shot. Like if we are in a finals for a hundred backstroke and we slip off a start and we don't make it, like that's it. That's it for the next four years. And so there's just so much immense pressure that you feel. So once you actually make it, it is like the weight of the world is lifted off your shoulders. So I think, you know, actually making the team, getting through my first trials, I think that gave me a lot of confidence going into London, even though it was my first games, because it was like I survived trials, right? So like if I can survive that, then now it's just time to have fun and go out and enjoy myself. So I definitely still felt a little pressure that I was putting on myself to still perform really well, because of course you're at the Olympic Games, you want to be at your absolute best. But I also continually had the mentality of to just enjoy myself and have fun. I was 17 years old and I was competing in an Olympic Games, like beyond a dream come true. So to really just sort of take in that experience, which I definitely did. So you competed both as a team and as an individual in 2012. And I wanted to talk first about the freestyle relay in which you and the US team won the bronze medal with you swimming the lead off. Um, what are the main differences and the skills needed for an individual team versus a team event? And what did it feel like to win the bronze medal for the US? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Well, first off, it felt amazing because that was my very first Olympic medal. So to win that, and we weren't a huge favorite in that race either. I think out of the three relays, which are the 4x100 freestyle, the 4x100 medley, and the 4x200 freestyle, the 4x100 historically for us, for women, has been probably our weakest of the three. So for us to medal, we were so excited. We were so thrilled. And in terms of what it takes, I think, of course, the, the diversity is, is really important. You know, you look at, you know, some countries may have really, really good, maybe one or two 100 freestylers, but for a relay, you need to put together four. So you don't only need really great talent, you need depth of that talent and that's where the relays really come through of like we don't just have you know one or two really good at this event we have more that we can put together to put on a really strong performance and I think that's why the 4x100 medley and 4x200 freestyle have always been so strong for us because we have such strong swimmers in each hundred of every stroke so our medley relay is always amazing and then we have such depth in our 200 freestylers so that relay is always amazing so it's it's always so fun to be in a ready room and be behind a block with three other women who are also some of your closest friends it just really makes it special having it be a shared experience um, turning now to your individual victory, um, in which you beat your own world record, sorry, your own record and won the 100 meters backstroke gold medal. Um, what would you point, what would you point to as your key reasons for success? And what impact did this incredible victory, a gold medal in your first Olympics have on your career? Yeah, well, I think two things in terms of what led to my success in that race, I think one of them was not counting myself out. I was not the favorite for that race by any means. And Emily Seabom, who is one of the greatest backstrokers the sport has ever seen, she swims for Australia. She came back first in prelims in semifinals. She broke the Olympic record and was seated first for finals. So looking at that statistically, you know, it's kind of a no brainer, like, oh, well, of course, she's gonna win. Um, she just went the fastest time in the history of the Olympics in the Hunter backstroke. And that's the kind of mentality that immediately takes you out of the race before it begins. And so I think I did a really good job at saying like, okay, 
this is going to be tough. Like this is going to be really, really hard. But the best part about swimming is it's not about who's been the best. It's who is the best right now in this moment. And so just going in with the belief that I can be the best right here, right now, and then also swimming my own race. You know, it can get very easy to, to distract yourself by, you know, okay, well, Emily's over here and I know that she takes it out really fast. So that means I need to go out fast. And then your own race plan and the way that you swim races can get thrown off. And then you're not really swimming your race anymore. You're swimming your opponents. And so I think by just diving in and doing my race and just swimming for myself, I think that ultimately is what is what got me to have my hand on the wall first, which is still still crazy to believe. Um, so after 2012, uh, what would you describe as some of your highlights in terms of um, your career and your performances? Oh gosh, uh, 2013 Worlds was definitely a highlight. Uh, I remember coming off of London and being actually extremely motivated. And you hear about this a lot is, and thankfully, I think a lot of athletes are speaking more about this as kind of the post-Olympic blues, you know, where you go to the Olympics, you achieve your greatest dreams, and then you come home and a lot of athletes really struggle mentally kind of figuring out now what, you know, like this has been the peak of their life, their career, and it can be really hard to really work on that transition of, so now what do I do? Now where do I go? And thankfully for me at the time, I knew I wanted to keep swimming and I was still so young that I really just felt motivated. I didn't want people to think that 2012 was just a fluke and that I just had one really good meet. I didn't want to be kind of the the one meet wonder. I really wanted to follow up my performance. And so I think that is what what motivated me so much throughout that training year. And then in 2013, um, I became the first woman ever to win six golds at a world championships in swimming. And that was huge for me. Um, that was a very lofty goal. And it's kind of one of those goals that you set for yourself where it's really scary because you don't know whether or not you're going to achieve it. Um, but I think that's how we should be setting our goals. If they're not scaring you, then they're not big enough. And we're not supposed to hit every goal that we make. I think if we do, then they're too easy. We have to keep pushing ourselves. We have to keep striving. And so to kind of meet that really scary goal and actually accomplish it, I think that just proved to myself a lot of, of what I'm capable of and, and just, you know, it, it's okay to, to set those goals really, really high and just see where they take you. Um, I wanted to ask now a bit about your training. So obviously you've spent all these years competing and preparing for all of these victories. How did you train yourself physically, not just kind of in terms of intens intensity, but also in terms of balance um, with the kind of coaches you had and so on? Yeah, I think, you know, it's practice, you know, not just actual training but it's it's practice with balance and with communication with your coaches and with learning your body and what it needs you know this is all stuff that comes over time and I was really grateful to work with the same coach from when I was 7 to 17 and then I went back with him again for 2016 but when I went to college that was a whole new transition period. You know, that was a new coach. That was a new team. That was a new city. So kind of having to rework, how do I find balance now within this? And I think it's really important for athletes to be flexible, um, physically and <laughs> metaphorically. But um, I think, you know, we get really into our routines. I think that's just how we're kind of brought up is, we're so regimented and we like routines. We, we know that routines work. And so we try to stick to those, but I think it's, it's okay to, to branch out, to try new things, because again, only by doing that, are we going to learn what is truly best for us and what works best for us? Because we will fail when we do that. We will find things that are like, Oh, definitely not. That's not working. That's not helping but that only gets us one step closer to figuring out what does work. So I think making sure that you're open to the learning process of it, even when you've been doing it for a really long time. And I remember I used to say before I retired because of an injury that the day I retired would be because I stopped learning. And that was how I approached every day. It was like, what can I learn today? What can I take away from this practice? Cause there's always ways to learn and grow and be better. 
Um, you've talked about how you had these two coaches. Um, could you tell us a bit about how important the personalities and relationships with coaches are um, for a swimmer in particular and how formative they can be, especially when you're young and kind of picking up professional swimming at such a young age? Yeah, absolutely. They, they are so important. I mean, the role a coach plays in an athlete's journey, it really can't be understated. And I think the number one thing that I've learned with working with so many incredible coaches who are also mentors and friends is communication is number one. Uh, it's like any relationship, whether it's friendship, romantic, familial, you have to communicate how you're feeling, what's working, what's not, because that's how that relationship grows. That's how you both get to know each other and what's best for you. Because knowing that your coach is equally, if not more invested in your own success as you are, like to have that kind of faith and trust in one another, it's just crucial. And then having that from a young age, I know not everyone is, is as fortunate to have that kind of coach and mentor that they can really rely on. Uh, so when you do, it, it really is impactful. You know, there are so many things that my coach told me growing up that I still think about every single day that have nothing to do with swimming whatsoever. So whether you're in athletics or not, whether you find a mentor that is your coach or just another adult that you can trust, I really cannot stress the importance of mentorship enough. And I think that's a really important thing for parents to hear as well, because parents and mentors I are the same thing. Our parents are our mentors, but I think it's also important to have a mentor that's not a parent because we hear things differently when we're younger, when our parents say them to us and when someone else says them to us, right? Like we get that all the time is when we go and, and do events with kids and we talk to them and we're speaking to them about their nutrition and eating right and staying on top of their schoolwork. Like all we get after are just thank yous from the parents that are like, we tell them that all the time, but like actually hearing it from you, like now they'll go and do it. And so just having people in your life that you can trust, that you can rely on, and that can kind of echo really what your parents are saying, but are just, you're, you're hearing it in a different way as a child that will really make it stick. Um, you retired, as you said, from swimming at the age of 23 after an injury. How did it feel saying goodbye to a sport that had been such a core part of your life from at such an early age? You know, it was very mixed feelings. Um, I think mainly because the essentially the last two years of my career, I was in constant pain. And so when I retired, when I said goodbye, honestly, the first feeling I felt was relief that I wasn't going to be in pain anymore. And of course, along with that comes just sorrow at, at losing something that I didn't think I was going to lose for a much longer period of time. You know, I wanted to compete in three Olympics. I wanted to compete in four. I wanted to win so many more medals. And that just was not my path. That was not my journey. And so to, to accept that and to trust that and know that just taking the next right step is, is all I could do, I think that really helped, really helped get me through it. But I, I went through, I suffered my shoulder injury in April of 2016. And from that moment on, it was just a constant battle. I think growing up my career, it was so wonderful. You know, I just kept training hard and I kept getting faster and, and doing better and better in competition. And, and that's such a fun thing to experience. And there was almost a, a sense of ease to it. Like, yes, I was training four to six hours a day. That part, it's not easy, but I loved what I was doing and everything kind of came naturally where after my injury, it was always this battle of, can I train? Can I be in the water today? What does my shoulder need? I would take three steps forward just to feel like I was taking two steps back because I needed something with my shoulders. And so it was really frustrating and it's hard to, to maintain your love for the sport and for what you're doing when you're constantly frustrated. So I think when that retirement letter came out, it was definitely a mixture of, of relief and, and sorrow, but no regret. Um, with, with your swimming career now kind of out of the way, what does the future hold for you? What, what are your plans with all this talent that you have and, and this um, outreach that you have with so many young people? 
Yeah, well, definitely the outreach. I don't know if my swimming talent is going to help me much anymore. <laughs> but I, I think the beautiful thing about sport is it, it gives you a platform and it gives you so many wonderful opportunities. And the ironic thing about it is while you're still competing, you have to say no to a lot of those things because training and competing are still your number one priority. So for essentially my entire career, as much as I hate the word no, I had to say it a lot because I knew that it's really hard to travel when you're trying to train four to six hours a day. And it's really hard to, to manage more on top of what you're already dealing with as a professional athlete. And so now I finally have the time and the opportunity to start saying yes to so many different things. And so I think for me, giving back is hands down the most important thing for me to be doing with my platform, with my voice, with my life. I, I've been given so much and I've had so much support and love shown to me along my journey that now... I just want to give it back however I can. So I want to stay very involved with the sport, especially the youth of our sport, you know, very involved with learn to swim programs, which I think is, you know, goes beyond swimming because that actually has the ability to save someone's life, which is amazing. Uh, working with different organizations that use sport for good all over the world, like Laureus being, being an Academy member at Laureus has been wonderful. And, just joined a board for a program in India where it's uh, an incredible, incredible program called UWA. And it's all about using football and young women to, to keep them out of childhood marriage and to educate them. And they just had their first graduation graduating class and actually two of the young girls got accepted into colleges here in the U.S., which is unbelievable. But I think showing people the power of sport and how it can change your life um, and how it can bring people together, I think there are very, very few things that can do that the way that sport does. So really just to continue to inspire and give back in, in the best ways I know how. I think following on from that, I wanted to ask about swimming often being quite an inaccessible sport. So how do you think it can be made more open and more accessible to those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, those with fewer facilities available in their areas, so on? Yeah. Well, I think first just awareness, right? The recognition that it isn't the most accessible sport out there. I think that's the first step in, you know, approaching any kind of injustice or inequality is becoming aware of it. And a lot of the programs I work with actually, so I'm with the USA Swimming Foundation and with Safe Splash. And both of those companies, we raise money to provide free swim lessons for children in lower income communities. So doing more work like that, where we not only recognize the injustice and the inequality, but then work to make a change and work to make those resources available, regardless of whether or not you can pay for them, because that should not be a prerequisite to whether or not a child learns how to swim. Like I said, that's a life lesson. So it, it is so important that everyone is exposed to that. So, you know, spreading the word that, it is unequal that there is limited access to those with fewer resources. And then, okay, let's make a change. How do we then bring that to them or bring them to us so we can teach them, we can get them in the water and make sure that they have every right to this as any child should. Um, what are the challenges you as a woman disproportionately have faced in swimming? And have you felt that your training, for instance, has always been tailored towards you. And I guess following on from that, how do you plan on opening up swimming to more women and more girls, not just kind of around the world, but also specifically in the United States near where you are? Yeah, absolutely. Well, to be totally honest, um, I have always felt that swimming was a very fair gender equal sport. Um, I have never felt discriminated against as a woman in my sport. I think that it's a beautiful thing. And I think a lot of that has to do with USA swimming. And I think the culture of swimming uh, is really, really good at promoting what each individual brings to the table. And so I, I know again, that I'm very fortunate in having experienced that and that that is definitely not the case. But again, I think it goes back to what we were saying when, you know, knowing that swimming lessons and pools aren't super accessible to those in low income communities, 
if there is a disparity in between gender equality and women feel like they're not getting the same kind of attention that they deserve, we need to be made aware of it and then we need to do something about it. And I think that's what's so amazing about what the USA women's soccer team has done. You know, they truly faced inequality uh, in terms of lack of pay and, and, and for so many other reasons. And they did something like they are truly trying to make that change. And so recognizing where that disparity stands and then doing something about it. Um, that is actually what I was going to next um, <laughs> talk about, which is the huge pay gap that exists between women's yeah. sport and men's sport. Um, how does this issue of the pay gap apply when it comes to swimming and with cases such as Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino from the US soccer team taking the challenge all the way to the law? What do you think needs to be done to overcome the glaring disparity that exists in so many sports? I mean, again, I think if it needs to be written into legislation, then that's what needs to happen. But I believe that every athlete should be paid based on what they have to offer, based on their performance. There should be no question about whether they're male or female or whether they represent this country or that country. We train so hard so that we get to share what we love with the world. And we don't do it for the money, but it is also our career and it is our livelihood. So when you are dedicating yourself to that and you have a truly unbelievable performance or multiple like the USA women's soccer team, and yet you see the disparity in what you are getting compensated for versus another team that may not have the same performance that is getting compensated more, that's really where the questions of inequality come in. So I think, you know, it really comes down to making sure that every athlete, again, no matter where they come from, what their gender is, they are, are being compensated for how incredible and amazing their performance is and what they are bringing and offering to the world. Um, I guess based on this wider conversation of accessibility and so on, what do you think can be done to improve the quality of training and education that girls and I guess all children receive at a young age when it comes to sport, particularly in schools that are located in lower income communities and areas? I think just making sure that there are programs in place there for those children to get involved with. And again, that's a lot of the work I'm doing with Laureus is so many of these sports projects are in lower income communities and there are programs, we have one here called Right to Play, that's in lower income schools that uses games during recess to teach children skills like leadership and teamwork all through sport. And that is the beauty of what sport does is yes, we're teaching you how to kick a ball and how to swim backstroke, but that's not the big picture. The big picture is we're also teaching you about work ethic and dedication and being a good leader and being a role model. That is really what we're trying to get across. So I think getting, you know, just that idea of how powerful sport can be and what lessons it can teach into the minds of young children and then making sure that if that's something they want to pursue they have that ability to do so they have a program nearby and of course we have a ton of work to do on that because that's definitely not the way it is right now there are so many children that don't have access to things like that but continuing to work until every single one of those kids does um, turning now very briefly before we take a question from the audience to the impact of COVID-19, which has obviously resulted in the postponement of the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. Could you tell us a bit about the impact this is having or this might have on the US swim team in particular and how they can kind of keep their training and so on going during the lockdown? Definitely. Well, I think the thing about the postponement is it's not going to impact any team differently. You know, it, it's been pushed back a year for everyone. So whatever challenges Team USA is facing, so are every other teams in, in the entire world. You know, they have another year of training now too. And so I think for, for every athlete competing, it's really just going to be the mental shift of, of accepting that they have another year of unbelievably intense training and dedication. And you know, I always laugh because a lot of people, especially if you're just in an Olympic sport, think that 
you only work hard for one year and then you just like chill out on your couch for three and then you start working again. <laughs> like, no, that's not how it works. We work hard every single year in the quad. It is all four years that we are still competing. We are still fighting. We are still working, but there is just something amped up about the year before the games where everyone just knows like it's coming. This is the big show. So I need to kick it in to that extra gear and really find something within myself. And that takes a lot. I mean, that in and of itself is exhausting just to find that extra gear, let alone train like that every single day. So I think just recognizing that there's going to be another year, but once it comes, everyone's going to be on a level playing field. And I think that's what's, what's really fair about it is everyone will have had the same amount of notice that it's going to be when it is. Everyone will have had the same amount of time to get back into shape, to be the best that they can be. And I think that's all what we love so much about the Olympics is it's, it's fair, it's just, it gives everyone a chance to prove themselves. And I think that's what it'll do just a year later. Our final question today comes from the audience. This one is from Johnny at New College and he asks, growing up, who were your biggest role models in swimming and what did you learn from them? Yeah, such a great question. So probably I would say Natalie Coughlin was my was my biggest role model. And I think it was just her grace, um, whether it was in the water, out of the water when she was giving an interview, she was always very authentic to herself and she always just handled herself with such poise. And I admire that so much. And I'm so fortunate that I got to know her deeply as a friend, you know, as I was, as I was coming up in the swimming world and we got to be on relays together and travel on across the world together. And not everyone gets to do that with their childhood hero. And so just being able to cherish that time with her and now seeing her grow into a mother and just to see the beautiful path of, of life that she's been on and all that she's achieved. I still, I still look up to her to this day. She's still one of my biggest role models. Great. Thank you so much, Missy. I think that brings us to an end of what has been a really, really insightful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I had such a great time.